obsession with this is really because um, I don't think data on its own without behavioural science or psychology uh, in a marketing context uh, is ever going to do the full job and it can be dangerous. And the reason for that, I think, is that uh, data provides, and very valuably, the what. And let's be honest, behavioural data is generally much more valuable and interesting than attitudinal data, because it shows what people actually do rather than what they claim to do. There's this famous quote misattributed to David Ogilvy when he said, the trouble with market research is that people don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. And so if you have data about the do, that's, I think, an order of magnitude better than uh, data about the say or the think. But I'm always conscious of the fact that if you don't understand the why, you only understand the what, you can get the what badly wrong, particularly if you make the what very, very rational. Um, now, I'll give, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you just a simple example of this, OK? Um, I always think most coffee shops and all tea shops close too early. I never understand why the natural time to have tea in Britain is 5 o'clock and tea shops tend to close at 4 o'clock. And it occurred to me that there's a possible reason why, which is that if you look at your sales data from a coffee shop, uh, which closes at, let's say, 4, OK, you'll notice a marked tailing off of sales for the last half hour you're open. And it would be very easy to infer from this, OK, we can see falling demand for coffee or tea um, from 3.30 onwards, therefore nothing's to be gained by staying open later. OK? And so you end up with things like what I always call the world's laziest Starbucks, which is the Starbucks on Platform 1 of Victoria Station, which bizarrely closes at about 8 o'clock. And then it occurred to me, maybe there's another reason, OK? Maybe the why isn't that people don't want coffee at... Um, four o'clock, five o'clock, it's that people don't like buying coffee from a place that's about to close. And maybe there's a darker reason still, which is that the people in coffee shops want to knock off early and get home and don't want buggers coming in and asking for coffee in the last 25 minutes they're open, because what they want to do in the last 25 minutes they're open is start mopping the floor and, you know, removing the strange crud from the nozzle on the, on the espresso machine. And sure enough, it turns out that that's quite a lot of what's going on. Uh, if you work for in a coffee shop and you're slightly mischievous, this is known as getting the mop out. Because the mere appearance of a mop or someone mopping the floor basically discourages anybody else from going into that shop and means that the people who are already there feel that they really ought to clear off now. And so the risk of someone buying coffee five minutes before you close is reduced to more or less zero. Uh, and, in fact, it's even easier than that, apparently. I spoke to someone else who said it's really, really easy to reduce uh, sales of coffee to zero in a coffee shop. Uh, you just put one chair upside down on top of another chair and nobody comes in. OK? Now, what I mean about that is it's very, very dangerous to have the what without the why. Because what we tend to do is make logical, kind of confident inferences from our data... But actually, if you don't know the real psychological reason that's going on behind the scenes, you can make completely the wrong inference. In fact, maybe you should be staying open later, and what you really need to make sure of is that actually nobody starts stacking the chairs outside the coffee shop for uh, you know, one minute before clo until one minute before closing time. The way you respond is totally different if the why is different. Now, if you recognise me uh, from anything, it's probably from a kind of joke I made at a... TED Global Conference in about 2009, where I merely made the point that um, we, ask, we ask the wrong questions in business so often, or we define success in narrow terms, typically the terms that are most um, amenable to numerical expression. So at the time, I was having a brief quibble with the idea that it was necessarily a great idea spending £6 billion reducing the journey time between London and Paris on the Eurostar by about 35 minutes by building completely new tracks between St Pancras and Folkestone. And my point was that actually the task at hand was not to make the Eurostar faster, it was to make travelling on the Eurostar more attractive than travelling by plane. Now... Planes are always going to be faster than trains. I think that's kind of a law of physics, basically. 
So maybe the best thing to focus on is not actually speed, where you're always going to lose a bit, OK? Instead, the thing to focus on is not quantity of time, but quality of time. And there are lots and lots of ways in which the quality of time on a train is much, much higher than the quality of time on a plane. You can have a big table. You don't have to keep being asked around. Because if you travel to Paris by air, yes, it's admittedly true that, you, that the flight, flight part of the journey only takes about 45 minutes, but there's another hour on each end effectively spent dicking around, during which time you can't watch a film, get on with useful work, or do anything else. So I merely made the half-joking suggestion that for 0.1% or 0.01% of that £6 billion, you could have Wi-Fi on the trains and maybe achieved exactly the same effect in terms of making the journey more desirable versus making the trains faster. And then I added a kind of whimsical point, which is, I said, if you really want to spend a billion quid, you can hire all of the world's top male and female supermodels, get them to walk up and down the train handing out free chate petrus to all the passengers, You'd have saved yourself five billion quid and people will ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> but I make this point because um, if you give engineers a problem, they'll define it in terms which are most amenable to be solved by engineering. OK? But the real problem is not how do we make the Eurostar faster. That's merely a means to an end and it may be the most expensive means of that. And it reminds me of Einstein's point. He said, if you gave me an hour to solve a really important problem, problem, I'd spend the first 55 minutes defining the question and then only the last five minutes answering it. Because if you start with the right question, you're much more likely to come up with a truly worthwhile answer as opposed to an answer that merely looks sensible. And I think in business we're in huge danger because of the needs to always make sense to each other, because you don't get... It's much, much easier to get fired uh, for being irrational than it is for being unimaginative. OK? Much, much easier to get blamed for doing something that seems weird than it is for doing something that seems boring. And so as a result in business, I think there's this inherent bias where we tend to like doing things that seem to make sense and that are quantifiable and that can be modelled, when in many cases I think we're directing resources to absolutely the wrong kind of thing. I mean, I don't know how many people have travelled on the Eurostar recently, but one of the slightly weird things about the Eurostar is it seems quite keen on capturing the most annoying aspects of air travel in a train. Like the fact that you're not allowed to board the train early and sit around just in your nice table. Instead, you're corralled in a weird gate and are only allowed to board the train in the last five minutes before it goes. You know, that's the most annoying thing. You know that business where you get at Euston where it says preparing train? OK? It won't tell you the platform, no, because they're preparing the like it's a bloody cake or something, right? <laughs> you know, now, you know, actually what people care about and what we measure don't align very well at all. And therefore, the cult of quantification is always in danger of creating massive misalignment with what people really need and care about. And I'll talk a bit more about this. But the, the upside of this, before I get too pessimistic... Oops, we, oh, that one, there we are. Is because psychology is messy, it's never going to lead to absolutely neat mathematical models, kind of Newtonian style reductionist models. The upside is because it's messy, magic is possible. By which I mean is that m most of economics, people love the idea of proportionality. And economics is dominated by the idea of trade offs because economics is really a model of human behaviour which is modelled on engineering. If you want more output, you need more input. You know, it's all about that kind of proportionality. The great thing about psychology is it's not nearly as neat as engineering, but actually magic is possible. The price you pay, in a sense, for certainty is that there are butterfly effects. You can exploit tiny little asymmetries in perception... OK, you can rephrase a sentence. Uh, we, we've, we've got cases where changing the, the opening few sentences from a call centre script um, fundamentally, uh, you know, will literally make £2 million. And that's because psychology is a complex system. There are butterfly effects where tiny, tiny interventions have absolutely monumental um, effects on the outcome. And so when Google talks about its moonshots, its 10x event, effects which I think it's right to do, by the way, alphabets, technically. Um, 
I think we should make the point that actually in the modern world we're often running up against the laws of physics. It's very difficult to make a train ten times faster, OK? We're simply running up against diminishing returns in the laws of physics. Psychological 10x is actually much, much easier. How do you make a train journey 10 times more enjoyable? OK? That's actually, a, weirdly, an easier question to answer, but weirdly, we ask it less, because we think that improvements have to be objective and quantifiable rather than emotional and felt. But actually, since behaviour is driven by human feelings, if it's easier to change human feelings, that's what we should do. And so... Big fan of this man, Nassim Taleb, who some of you may know is the author of The Black Swan and Fooled by Randomness. And he always talks about his study as the hidden asymmetries in everyday life. And most people who want to understand the world, OK, I don't mean want to understand it properly, but want to feel they understand the world, do so by pretending it's symmetrical and by pretending that the average is representative of the whole. OK? It makes it just much, much easier to understand if you just start from the assumption. But as Mark Ritson quite rightly says, averages are the enemy of the marketer. Now, most data is collected for reporting upwards to shareholders, to finance people, OK? Most data is collected for the purpose of aggregation and for the purpose of collecting averages because that's really all the shareholders care about. How much in total do I get? The market has got to look at it at a 90-degree angle, what Mark Ritson calls the 90-degree flip. We're actually interested in what makes people different. We're not interested in the false pretense of pretending there's one representative agent who can stand for all customers. And so, whereas most people spend most of their lives trying to pretend the world is even and symmetrical, our job is to do the opposite, which is actually to look for cases where it really, really isn't. OK? And so... Real life is really, really asymmetrical. It's really disproportionate. One of the reasons I think people find creative people annoying is that creative people have no sense of proportion. They get really, really obsessed by trivial things and they don't seem to care about things which they should care about. I would argue that actually creative people are right not to have a sense of proportion because neither does their audience. OK? Anybody here run a call centre? Nobody? OK. Um, that's slightly worrying, because, it's, uh, but anyway, if you've got a call, here's just an example of this, OK? Now, I've only got this as a theory, but I think it'll be borne out. If you run a call centre, don't make people wait on the phone. Give them an opportunity to request a call back, OK? Now, I, I made the suggestion in Israel. I couldn't understand why everybody in the audience was basically not listening for the next five minutes until someone came and explained to me afterwards that in Israel, it's illegal not to offer a call back. If you make someone wait for more than 20 seconds on the phone, you have to offer a call back, and you have to call back within two hours, OK? Or you're fined, OK? Pretty good idea, if you ask me. But my point about the call back is that although the contents of the call might be identical, the feeling of the person on the phone, the customer, is totally different. Because if you make them wait, they feel like a supplicant and like you don't really want to talk to them, OK? Right? If you call them back, they feel like a valued customer, they feel flattered. And the chance of upselling them, cross-selling them or retaining them, I would argue, might be three or four times greater if you call them back than if, the, if you make them wait. But nobody tests this stuff because the call centre is just run by a load of like, procurement cost-saving nerds whose only interest is not the emotional state of the customer, it's just getting as many people th throughput at as low a cost as possible, which is nuts, by the way. I mean, as a brand-building opportunity, a, you know, a biannual phone call with a company can be absolutely decisive in your relationship with that brand. So to treat that thing as if it's just a cost rather than an opportunity seems to be absolutely trivial. But this is just an example of disproportionality. Does anybody recognise this, by the way? It's called the Kano model. And Kano is a Japanese guy at the University of Tokyo who plotted how various features, functions and levels of functionality in a product, or a service for that matter, translate into customer satisfaction. And some of them, by the way, are negative. You can add function, functionality to a product and actually increase customer dissatisfaction. Now, anybody bought a Samsung telly in the last year or two? 
Okay, you might have got a remote control with only about six buttons on it alongside the other remote control. That is a brilliant example where most people treated their TV... You know those TV remote controls where 90% of the buttons you never use and, in fact, frighten you to death, right? Because if you press the wrong one inadvertently, a strange green number two will appear on the top left of your screen. And you, I mean, a, literally a number two, not a turd. OK, just be clear. OK, but a number two will appear on your screen and you can't make it go away. So you very carefully... You know, people, there are actually people who put tape over all of their remote control except for the volume and channel button. OK, that, that's an example of adding functionality and making customers less happy. I had a conversation with a high-end hotel group last week in which I said, the business of hotels trying to take your luggage when you arrive is an example of something they think is a service but which most customers really hate, right? Because I've just spent the last eight hours going, don't lose your suitcase, don't lose your suitcase, remember your suitcase, pick it up from the carousel, make sure nobody else at the carousel nicks your suitcase, grab, hold on to your suitcase, put it in the back of the taxi, and then you arrive at a hotel, and before you even know which room you're in, a complete stranger wants to take your bag, OK? Now, they think it's a service, actually most customers hate it. So some, some, of, some of the time, it's not only disproportionate, it's actually negative. Um, then you get things which are just table stakes, must-have. That's you know, If you buy a carton of milk, it shouldn't leak. If there's a brand of milk and you buy it and two times out of three the carton springs a leak, you'll never buy it again. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that people get really excited by non-leaking cartons. It doesn't work in that direction. It's purely a table stake. If you don't sort this out, you're not in business. Then you have things to which people are completely indifferent. In other words, you spend a lot of time improving something and nobody notices. Now, an example of that I'd give is, most of you are too young to remember this, but before you had flat beds in business class on airlines, airlines used to compete by the level of pitch recline, OK? Most airlines only offer you, like, 45% recline. We offer you 57 Now, the truth of the matter is, there are two comfortable modes for humans. They're sitting in a fucking chair and lying in a bed, right? Nobody goes, ooh, I really like the look of that slope over there, right? <laughs> OK? So that was a case where airlines were competing on something which was just totally irrelevant, that people, you know, basically either make the damn thing a bed or make it a chair, right? Then you have things which are one-dimensional. Those tend to be fairly sensible. That, that would be... The one-dimensional things tend to be the core performance attributes of the item in question. You know, it might be you know, sound reproduction quality, something of that kind. Okay? And those are, roughly speaking, proportionate. Okay? But then you have these weird things, which are sometimes called attractors, sometimes called delight attributes, which are weirdly tangential to the function of the product or service being delivered, but which deliver happiness or customer satisfaction or loyalty in insane proportions. And the reason they're rare is that finance directors try and kill them because they look silly. Okay? If anybody's checked in at a Doubletree hotel and they have a little oven underneath the check-in desk and they keep cookies warm, and they're actually really, really good cookies they make for their own... Um, you, you've done it, OK? And it's childish, it's pathetic. The reason it's meaningful and exciting is precisely because no other hotel does it. Apparently, the finance director's been trying to kill it off for ages. The marketing director just makes the cookies busy, bigger to wind him up. <laughs> OK? But one tip as a marketer, if you're not annoying your finance director with some of the things you do, you're not really doing your job. Because I'll give you the perfect example of this, because Kano worked extensively with the Japanese consumer electronics industry. And... Now, uh, apologies to the young folk here, OK, because this might seem a bit weird, but the absolute classic case of a delight attribute was in the cassette deck of the 1980s, and it was the eject mechanism, OK? Now, uh, you have to be of a certain age to remember this, but you'd think when you bought a cassette deck, build quality, sound reproduction, you know, power output, those would be the important things, and they weren't irrelevant, but they were one-dimensional. What really got people excited was the eject mechanism. If it was kind of damped and counterbalanced and opened with a lovely hiss, you thought, that's a brilliant cassette deck. Whereas the really shitty ones, you just pressed a button, they went clack, OK? DVD players, for those of you who are a bit younger, had the same kind of thing. You had to have this ludicrously kind of, you know, kind of Thunderbirds-like thing which opened and then a kind of whole disc came out. And I noticed that... Most DVD players had the weirdest thing imaginable, which is 
they actually, you could open the disk drawer with the remote control, which when you think about it, the only possible purpose of that was to show off how nice your eject mechanism was, because unless you were the world's most accurate discus thrower, <laughs> there's not really much use to being able to open your disk, your, your disk drawer with a remote control. But what's so lovely about this is we, we much prefer the one-dimensional, which is proportionate and incremental and makes sense, over the delight attribute, which is kind of silly and gratuitous, but actually is the thing that disproportionately adds value. And I think the same is absolutely true of services, as well as it's true of products, by the way. I think this model is just really, really useful. And this is a beautiful example of how you can genuinely produce magic, OK? Imagine you're a kind of Michelin-starred, pretty posh restaurant, and you really would prefer your customers not to use mobile phones at the table, OK? Well, 99 out of 100 of us would probably, we'd probably choose a slightly more attractive side than this, or we might write something on the menu, OK? But we'd write something along the lines of mobile phones not allowed, or please do not use your mobile phone, which pisses people off, right? Because I'm going to spend 100 bloody euros on a meal, I don't want someone bossing me around. Okay? And people really, really hate turning their mobile phones off or being told to. If ever you've had one of those off-site meetings where you go, now, for all of us to concentrate, we're all going to turn off our mobile phones, immediately seven people go, actually, my dad's in hospital at the moment uh, and I need to be contacted. Oh, shit, he's not in hospital, right? Okay? But people hate turning off their mobile phones so much, they just come up with stories like, you know, you know and you just imagine it. One restaurant, saint Emilion, France, did this. I think this is absolute genius. And it's just an example of what you might call real delight and cleverness, OK? They put a notice on the door which was visible to everybody coming into the restaurant, but which was ostensibly aimed at people leaving the restaurant. And it said that. <coughs> now, what's so clever about that is it looks helpful, not bossy. OK? And it implies there's a social norm. We don't need to tell you what to do. But naturally, as a person of high sophistication, uh, you will be turning off your mobile phone. Indeed, you'll be breaching a kind of established social norm if you accept a phone call during the meal at our fine establishment. That's what I mean about total genius, where if you want to achieve behavioural change, you can do it in a nasty way and you can do it in a nice way. And um, in many ways, actually, I mean, one of the phrases I always use is, in, in, you know, in, in engineering, the opposite of a good idea is a bad idea. Uh, in psychology, the opposite of a good idea is often another good idea. That actually there are, in, in, in providing services, there are two ways you can do it. You know, there are two ways you can make hotel check-in good. You can either automate the whole thing and make it super streamlined, or you can make it super high-touch and personal. OK, what you can't do is something in the middle. And so I think understanding that's really useful. But what I love doing is I always describe behavioural economics as the science of knowing what economists are wrong about, OK? And one of the things I think that's incredibly exciting is once you stop believing in economics, the solution space for everything becomes much, much bigger. Now, this is the part of the loyalty programme we helped develop with Deschoum, OK? And they were quiet, I think, before 6 p.m., Monday to Thursday, they were a bit quiet. So they gave a key ring, it was originally a set of dice, to their most regular customers and said, if you pay your bill before six, we're going to give you a discount. Well, that's not that exciting. So we didn't make it a discount. We said, if you pay your bill before 6 p.m., Monday to Thursday, we'll bring you a die, a singular of dice, OK? And if you throw a six, you get your whole meal for free. Now, to an economist, that's identical to a 16.6% .6 discount, OK? Trust me, to the human brain, it is not identical. A 16.6% .6 discount is extremely boring and doesn't encourage you to do anything, whereas a one in six chance of getting your meal for free is really, really exciting, OK? Another thing, by the way, is 16.6% .6 off doesn't really encourage you to spend any more. A one in six chance of having a free meal does encourage you to order a bit large because you'd feel a bit of a dick if you skimped on everything and then ended up getting it for free. So if you're going to order a round of cocktails, now is the moment, right? Okay. So to an economist, that's the 16.6% .6 discount. Trust me, 
absolutely not. And I was on this weird call with a bunch of people from William Blair Associates, which is a sort of Chicago, privately owned miniature Goldman Sachs, OK? And these guys, not knowing we'd been involved in the loyalty programme, started raving about the fact that whenever they went to London, they always went to Dishoom before 5pm or 6pm, and they used to take a colleague who they thought had a hot hand at throwing the dice, right? And how, on two occasions, they got their whole meal for free. And this was like the most exciting thing they did when they came to London, OK? Now, trust me, you wouldn't say that about a 16.6% .6 discount. What was really interesting is that about a third of these guys could have bought the bloody restaurant, OK? But they still found this absolutely motivating. They wouldn't have crossed the street for a 16.6% .6 discount. So this business of actually, but once you stop pretending that economics is, tr is true, you're pretend you start acknowledging there are huge asymmetries in perception and psychology and behaviour, then the creative solution space becomes bigger. The downside is it becomes messier. I accept that, OK? Being creative is good business advice. It's not always good career advice. Uh, John Maynard Keynes said, you know, worldly wisdom teaches that it's sometimes better for the reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. There are an awful lot of influences within a large institution or a large company encouraging you not to stick your neck out, OK? But nonetheless, if you can expand the creative solution space, the, one of the first big steps you can do is by stopping pretending that um, economics is true. Now, I had a one, wonderful experience talking to someone from a company which, for obvious reasons, I won't name. You know when it is you go into the, into the supermarket and they're like McCain oven chips? It wasn't McCain, but I'll use McCain oven chips as an example. And it's 50% extra free and you usually buy them, right? And I always ask the question, <coughs> do people buy them because they're actually cheaper? Or do they just go, there's a deal there, I'll have that one, OK? And I said I'd always wanted to do the experiment where you put 50% extra free, but you put the price up by 50%, OK? To see what component of the additional sales was economic and what component was basically attentional, OK? Now, obviously, it's completely illegal and unethical. I'm, I'm not totally idiot, right? I didn't spot that. But I'd always wanted to do the experiment just to see what happened. And talking to one person from a large multinational, which I won't name, he said, I know the answer to that question. <laughs> I thought, you know, what are you admitting to? He said, no, no, we do thousands of these every year. We're a huge multinational organisation. And once or twice a year, we make a mistake. We put 50% extra free, and we put the price up by 50%. I said, well, what happens? He said, put it this way. He said, I can't tell you the figures. He said, you wouldn't believe how much money we make. You know, I'll give you an example, OK? How many of you, when you... Marks and Spencers are here, aren't you, right? Genius. A couple of bits of genius from M&S. One of them is, what is it, dine in for two for ten pounds, OK? Brilliant bit of framing, OK? If you're M&S, you can't really compete with Lidl or Tesco on price, OK? So you frame your price against a restaurant meal, not against your grocery competitors. Beautiful, OK? Second thing, you know those things at M&S where you get three for seven quid? You know, the dips and the things, right? Does anybody actually add up the three prices to check they're over seven quid? I assume they are. I've never, I've never bothered, have you? I'm not going to sit there going £2.63, £3.15. I just go, I better buy three of these bastards because there's a deal there and I hate the idea of missing out, OK? Now, um, this is my point. Once you start acknowledging psychological um, asymmetries and anomalies and disproportions, the world becomes, OK, it goes from being drafts to chess, OK, but magic is possible. And I think one of the most important things I'm going to make, make as a point here is that um, we also have to stop this marketing culture where everything we do requires advanced proof, OK? Because th most innovation doesn't make sense except in retrospect. All right? Most products, most really innovative new products, people don't want until they have them. And I call that a kind of ratchet effect. You could call it the Diderot effect, if you want. Um, Diderot basically was given an expensive um, uh, uh, silk dressing gown, probably the one he's wearing in that portrait. And as a result of owning it, all the rest of his wardrobe suddenly seemed dowdy by comparison. Okay? The really effective new ideas don't actually... They, they create converts through use and experience, OK? I've got a Japanese toilet. Anybody else got... Nobody? 
Okay, put it this way, okay, once you get a Japanese toilet, there's no going back. <laughs> Nobody wants one, but once you've had one, the gap between having a Japanese toilet and going back to dry wiping is about equivalent to the yawning gulf between using a conventional toilet and shitting in a hole in the garden, okay? <laughs> that's, about the, that's about the extent of the improvement, all right? And one of the things that worries me now is that marketers are trying to look scientific, but at the price of losing the magic that is what makes marketing valuable in the first place. And that's what worries me, because I think there are far more good ideas you can post-rationalise than are good ideas you can pre-rationalise. OK, if you look at really... OK, well, here, here's one. I won't bother with the one on the left, just to save time. Anybody getting their kitchen done? OK, tip. Get two dishwashers. And you're going to think, this guy's nuts. Why on earth would you have two dishwashers? I'm not running a catering operation, right? You've got to think about it really deeply. It only makes sense when you really think about it. When you have two dishwashers, you never have to empty the dishwasher. OK? You have a dirty one and a clean one. And you take plates out of the clean one, eat off them, put them in the dirty one. When the dirty one's full, you turn it on, and when it's finished, that is now a cupboard full of totally clean crockery. And you take that out, you eat off it, put it in the now empty dishwasher, which eventually becomes the dirty dishwasher. So you don't lose any storage space, OK? And you never have to empty the dishwasher ever again in your life, except when you want a plate, OK? Now, what's interesting about that is it's only obvious in retrospect, isn't it? You know, nobody's actually thought of that in advance. And I think that's true of lots and lots of other ideas. They only make sense in retrospect. Um, so, whoops. The second thing that's really important to know about any kind of innovation or experiment is that um, most adoption of new products and behaviours, OK, is a sigmoid curve. It's slow at first. That's because most people operate on two primary motivations. The two default modes of human behaviour are habit and social copying. Do what I've done before and do what everybody else does. OK? Now, when you think about it in evolutionary terms, the principal motivation of evolution in forging our brains is not to enable us to make perfect decisions, it's to avoid us making catastrophic decisions. All of you are here today because all of your ancestors on both sides managed to reproduce before they got killed, OK? Right? By definition, I think it's safe to say. All right? Now, in evolutionary terms, what that means is if you do what you've done before, it's quite likely to be safe because, by definition, you're still alive to contemplate doing it again. And if you do what everybody else does, well, they're probably acting on past experience and it makes sense to actually make intelligent inferences from the behaviour of others. If you find yourself in an unfamiliar tribe and they all eat the purple berries but they won't touch the yellow ones, the clever thing to do is to copy them, OK? Similarly, if you've always eaten the purple berries and had no ill effects, and there are plenty of purple berries around, why risk the yellow ones? OK? Perfectly logical. But because of these two forces, habit and social copying, any kind of new behaviour takes longer than you'd think to be adopted. It's not a linear relationship. And I think because of this, by the way, the real question to ask that businesses don't ask... I was watching The Dragon's Den on YouTube the other day, um, uh, uh, and um, I, I, I don't, don't get me wrong, I don't think The Dragon's Den is representative of normal business. I think both The Dragon's Den and The Apprentice are in many ways slightly dangerous because they give school children and young people a completely weird idea of what business is about, OK? For example, with n almost no cooperation, you know, cutthroat competition and then weird inventions, OK? <laughs> But the one, there was a, a, a kind of assemblage of their worst mistakes, the businesses they hadn't invested in, which they should have done. Prime amongst them was a thing which ended up being bought by Just Eat called Hungry House. Uh, it got bought by Just Eat for 220 million. And with one exception, the dragons were completely uninterested in this because they didn't think people would order f f takeaway food off the internet. And it occurred to me, they were all of them, the, both the people presenting and the people in the room, failed to drill down to what was the really important question, which was a behavioural one. When people use your product, do they use it again? And I think that's the critical thing, that stickiness is the thing we should measure much more. Now, finance directors aren't interested in whether five people buy a product once or one person buys a product five times in a row. 
I think that asymmetry from a marketing standpoint is absolutely decisive. Because they were there with Deborah Meaden going, I don't think anybody's ever going to order food off the internet. You just ring your local Indian restaurant, it's much easier. Bear in mind, this was quite a few years ago, okay? They aren't being totally stupid because it was still up for debate, perhaps. But the real question that nobody asked, which they should have asked, is when people order a meal online and get it delivered and it arrives, do they do it again? I think, that's, I think it's a hugely important question because there are an awful lot of technologies which take a long time to penetrate or become adopted. What's really important is how sticky they are. Okay? I and mean, I think, you know, I think the important thing with electric cars, by the way, isn't how many people are buying electric cars. The really important statistic, which seems to be very high, is when people buy an electric car, how many of them, very few of them seem to go back to a petrol car. So maybe all this legislation isn't actually necessary. If once people have experienced an electric car, they stay electric, maybe we don't need to, maybe we don't need to force people off petrol. It will happen anyway. But my final, uh, my final grumble, if you like, is to do with category. One of the problems with um, the whole marketing industry is because most of the money resides with brands, OK? Uh, we spend too much time on brand level problems and not enough time deploying creativity on category problems. Okay? And sometimes they're actually at loggerheads. So all this effort from electric car makers to go, ooh, look, our range is five miles longer than their range, is focusing consumers' attention, the battle of range, is focusing consumers' attention on the one real negative of buying an electric car. Okay? It's actually self-defeating. It's good. It might be good for your individual brand, but it's actually category damaging. And I think with um, online retail, I think the really big questions now are category questions. I'm just going to ask a few questions here. Ultimately, I don't think e-commerce works in the next 10 to 15 years unless we get locker delivery and collection established where instead of delivering to 22 million households or 25 million households, we deliver to kind of 22,000 or 40,000 lockers. Because the last mile costs, uh, the costs in terms of traffic congestion, the environmental costs, um, the fact that, by the way, one of the great things I think unnoticed with lockers, of course, is if you've got a locker at a gas station, uh, you can deliver at 3 o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock at night. You can't do that in a residential area. OK? Um, I ultimately think that I don't think, um, and I, I and now interestingly, I think it will be quite easy to nudge people. I think I think locker delivery is one of those things, a bit like a ratchet, which is nobody wants to do it, but once they've experienced it a few times, then they don't go back. It's what you might call a kind of a cardo was very much like this in the early days. Nobody wanted their groceries delivered online. The trick with a cardo is you get people to do it three times; they become a convert. And part of that, by the way, is good. Those of you who read Thinking Fast and Slow, if you've done something several times in reasonably quick succession, it becomes system one rather than system two. And so the cognitive price of doing it just becomes lower with repetition. Okay? But the first time you order your groceries online, it would be actually easier to crawl to the supermarket over broken glass, wouldn't it? Because you've got to find everything for the first time. Then over time, they, you know, they know who your favourites are and so on, um, and it becomes easier and easier and easier, but it also becomes cognitively easier because you're doing it without thinking. I mean, the comparison there is learning to drive, okay? When you first learned to drive, learning to drive was a conscious system to activity where you're getting mirror, signal, manoeuvre, brake, clutch, okay? Then eventually, after you've been driving for a certain length of time, it becomes entirely system one, right up to the point of that slightly scary level where you have no memory of the last 10 minutes of driving at all, where you drift off into a complete funk, OK, and you're thinking about something completely independent. You suddenly go, shit, I've just driven 15 miles and I have absolutely no clue what was going on. I mean, you assume you haven't hit anybody, OK? But, I mean, it's become totally system one. I think, I think ultimately, I also think there's a cognitive limit to the number of things people can cope with having ordered or being in the ether at any one time. I think there's a practical limit to the amount of e-commerce that can go on before people's homes turn into kind of logistics hubs. And, you know, uh, and, you know, and every Zoom call you make is interrupted by someone ringing on a doorbell. Some form of consolidation is needed. Uh, one thing I don't understand, OK, and I suspect that the whole business of delivery and fulfilment 
is handled by people in logistics or operations, not by people in marketing. Is that true? Right? And all they're interested in is putting as much volume through a single parcel delivery as possible so you can get the maximum rebate. Is that what's going on? I think there's a huge gain, okay, a potential what you might call moonshot gain in offering people a whole choice of how they get things delivered. And there are several reasons for that. Um, people have very strong prejudices with different um, courier companies to the point where they actively hate some of them. Secondly, if you choose the delivery company and something goes wrong, the consumer blames you, the retailer. If they choose the courier company and something goes wrong, it's now their fault. So you don't become, if you like, the scapegoat for every missed delivery or card saying, we called but you're out. And the third thing is people have very strong preferences and aversions here. The fourth thing is, by the way, people are just happier with any shit they get to choose. OK? I mean, it's a simple bit of psychology, but people are happier. If you say, do you want to sit by the window or do you want to sit by the wall, OK? People, and people say, I want to sit by the window, OK? People are now happier because they've chosen it than if you sat them by the window without asking, OK? I had the weirdest experience of that, bit of a digression, but I arrived at the cafe <laughs> overlooking the Grand Canyon, and um, uh, we said, uh, can, can we have a seat by the window, please? And the woman, with no hint of irony, said, uh, do you want a view of the canyon or do you want a view of the car park? <laughs> and, oh, that's right, I said, we've just, we've just travelled all the way from England to look at your magnificent car park. <laughs> and she said, well, look, if you worked here as long as I have, you get sick of the goddamn canyon. And, OK, fair enough. All right. But, but I think if you give people a choice, you will notice immense effects. And it doesn't happen because this isn't a, this isn't a marketing decision. It's some nerdy procurement bloke decision. Um, where they probably get bonused on some rebate or other. But I think, I mean, one very strong thing I've discovered, by the way, is a lot of people, for example, who live remotely or live alone, don't like strangers knowing where they live. So they want it delivered by Royal Mail, because the postman obviously knows where you live. You've got no choice about that. But they don't want a load of weird people in vans going, hmm, live alone, a lot of nice furniture. OK? Right? So, again, this is a classic case. And by the way, the consumer's paying for this shit. So shouldn't they at least choose? If they're actually paying for delivery, shouldn't you at least give them the decency of letting them choose who delivers? I don't understand why Shopify doesn't have a search engine. Does anybody else wonder that? Right? You've got all these retailers, interesting independent retailers, but it's not really searchable. I think you can get consumers searching Shopify very, very easily with a bit of behavioural nudging. And I did ask the person at Shopify, and they came up with a really weird explanation that it would mean discriminating between their different customers. But I said people would rather be discriminated between and make lots of money than be treated fairly and go bust. So I'm not quite sure about that logic. This is a really interesting idea, by the way, from a behavioural standpoint. Anybody come across Nair Street? OK, it allows um, retailers, um, physical retailers in the high street, and by the way, one important thing about the locker is it can pretend, if you have an open access locker network, it can help rescue high street retail. Because they can actually drop things off at the end of the day. This would be a fantastic companion product. It basically allows you to upload your inventory, okay, to the web, and then Google makes it searchable. So if you search for a bottle of Glen Farkless now, it will give you a load of online people who will deliver Glen Farkless to you, okay? If you've uploaded it on Near Street, I think Google likes this particularly because it hurts Amazon, and that's basically their hobby, isn't it? It's all rivalry, this stuff. OK? But now it will say, if, if you live in, let's say you live in East Grinstead, it will say there are three shops in East Grinstead that have a bottle of Glen Farkless 25-year-old. Click here to reserve. OK? So it actually puts physical retail in search world on an equal footing with, um, uh, with uh, uh, remote retail. Now, I've got to skip this. I've mentioned this point before. Many economic problems and marketing problems in disguise. Rootle around your business, and you'll find loads of problems which engineers are trying to solve or logistics people are trying to solve, which can be solved psychologically. Uh, you know, uh, one of my favourite examples of psychological value creation is the overground. Most of the overground existed 20 years ago, that rail network. Okay? I actually used it about 20 years ago to go from Canary Wharf uh, no, not Canary Wharf, to Stratford to Richmond, because I was a rail nerd, and, I, and it was completely weird. It was like tumbleweed in the stations. I was the only person on the train, okay? 
They did put new trains on. They, they added a couple of miles of track. Most of that, literally, what they did was they put the overground on the tube map for the first time, and people understood what it was and how they could use it, OK? That was the creation of three billion pounds worth of infrastructure, mostly using ink. By which I mean the infrastructure was already there. What wasn't there was the human ability to understand how it fitted in with your journey. By adding it to the tube map, they made basically a worthless railway line into you know, a, you know, a billion dollar railway line. To a point where a um, colleague of mine's daughter said, uh, I want to live in Peckham, Dad, because it's really handy for Shoreditch. A sentence which, had you uttered it in 1989, would have got you committed to an institution. Uh, but never mind. OK? That was extraordinary. You can create value in the mind, OK? Because value is only meaningful to the extent that it's perceived. It's a complete mistake of mainstream economics to assume that value is created in the factory. You can create a whole lot of value in a factory, and if people don't want what it is you've made, OK, you haven't created any value at all. And fundamentally, there are a lot of problems which we try and solve logically, which we can solve psychologically. This is a lovely case from an insurance company where um, uh, all their customers complained that they spent too long paying the claims checks. And so they were going to lose a load of cash flow and uh, have a complicated kind of IT overhaul to send out the claims checks faster. Until a guy on the board said, in the human brain, there's no such thing as fast and slow. There's faster than you expect and slower than you expect. Next time, how long does it take, he said, to pay a claims check? He said, about 10 days. OK, every time you agree to pay a claim, tell them to expect their check in 14 days. Then send it in 10, just as you do now. Every single complaint disappeared. OK? Instead, they got a small number of calls from very nice customers going, thank you for sending my check so quickly. The reality hadn't changed. You just changed the expectation. OK? Now, I'll end on this very quickly. We, don't, we can't measure these things. This is from David Rock, a neuroscientist in New York. We can measure time. We can measure SI-derived units like cost and value and, you know, metres and weight and temperature, right? We don't know how to measure feelings. And as a result, we focus on what we can measure, not what on what's important. So these are the things, it's called the scarf model. These are the kind of things uh, which people really, really care about. If, if, if any of you run a loyalty programme, you can see how a loyalty programme can play to all of these things. Just take certainty, for example, OK? That's the Uber map. You don't reduce the time it takes for your car to arrive. You increase the level of certainty about where your car is and how long it's going to take. You don't change the quantity of waiting time, you change the quality of waiting time, and you change it from, oh, God, I bet they're lying, where's the car, maybe he's outside, what if he's parked round the corner, to, oh, look, he's stuck at those traffic lights, I'll have another pint, OK? Quantity the same, quality different, OK? Now, you know, similarly, this, member since 09, does absolutely nothing except it says, we, American Express know how long you've been a customer of ours. Now, to finance, that doesn't matter, OK? Finance tends to look at the world through the lens of individual standalone transactions. To human beings, the length of tenure, and the recognition of your length of tenure really, really matters. If you run a, a utility company, the majority you know, of letters of complaint will start with, I have been a customer of yours for X years. Imagine my surprise when. Occasionally, American Express make a mistake and they send out replacement cards that say member since 23 instead of, say, member since 09. More than half the people complain and ask for them to be replaced. British Airways, anybody belong to the loyalty programme? Uh, the lifetime tier points are really important for that reason. They show that we have got a we're not a goldfish. We've actually got a memory of your past transactions and we know you're a valuable customer. So it's a form of recognition, but it's also a form of relationship. I'll, I'll, I'll end on this. No, I won't. I'd better, better end on this to save time, because we want to have one or two questions. We've got time for two questions, you think? Yeah. These, so I run the behavioural science practice at Ogilvy. What we tend to do is we try and find out the why behind the what, and we study exactly what economists are wrong about, because the trick to business isn't being right. It's finding something your competitors are wrong about. OK? much more valuable to find an assumption that everybody else makes and then break it than it is to be just banally and kind of uniformly right. 
And so we're always excited by the fact that 16.6% .6 discount is not the same as a one in six chance of getting something for free. We're always excited by these asymmetries and peculiarities because that's where the moonshots lie. Uh, these are books written by me and my colleagues, and that's us. So thank you very much indeed. And um, I'd be very, very happy to take probably, what, two questions? I've overrun a tiny bit, have I? It's okay, I'm okay, thank you. <laughs> right, lovely. We do have time for one or two questions, but mm. first I have to ask, do you use two dishwashers at home? No, my, my <laughs> wife wouldn't let me. Um, I had the kitchen done, and she thought, uh, and um, she made a spurious argument about counter space. Oh, no. uh, I, I, I couldn't understand it. <laughs> I tried, so I did try. Next and time the people, you do people from Mila, by the way, uh, I did, I did do my best. So uh, sorry Lovely. about that. Well, I'll open it up to the audience now. So we have time for two questions. So please put your hands up if you're on the bottom here, and we will come and find you. Is, some, is that a question up top, or oh no, no, it's not. Okay. There's one over here. Super. Um, do, you, do you find that the, the sort of how online behaviour works with US customers and UK customers differs significantly? It's interesting, and that whole cultural question is really interesting because uh, you get it obviously in terms of massively in terms of payment type and massively in terms of attitude to debt or credit. Uh, you probably also get it hugely in terms of returns, um, in that. There probably still is a British thing in some people, which is, I don't want to be a nuisance, which I don't think American customers have had for sort of 30 or 40 years. I mean, that business, is it, is it bracketing, you call it, where people order three sizes of something and then return two of them, OK? My hunch would be that's considerably rarer in the, U it's rarer in the UK. In the US, it might be considered a perfectly normal thing to do because, um, you know, the slight deference towards you know, corporations and not wanting to be awkward. Um, I'd also say that there's, a, that, that, I mean, it depends on your category, but someone put it beautifully when they said that, for example, grocery retailing in the UK is all about brand, and in the US it's all about price, with a few exceptions. Um, I mean, that varies to, an you know, if you look at German grocery retailing versus British versus American, for example, uh, you see very stark things. And those happen simply because, as I said, people copy other people. And what's normal is uh, largely produced by what other people do. I mean, what, what, what are your own What are your own takes on that? Yeah, I, I, I sort of see online websites in the US always seem to be a lot flashier and a bit more in your face, and it's a bit tricky to hold the <coughs> in the UK. Um, yeah, I, th I mean that was always the difference with advertising, which is that, as someone put it, they said that what was quite nice about British advertising in the 70s compared to American advertising is it admitted that maybe, just maybe, the product wasn't the most important thing in the world, and that it adopted a little bit more... In other words, there was probably slightly more of that slightly snobby European thing about if you're desperate to sell the thing, maybe it isn't all that good. You know, I mean, the two extremes, in, if you like, there, there seems to be... Or we, I mean, Jeffrey Miller talks about the difference between in the United States, big is good, whereas Europeans tend to prefer intricacy or, com you know, or, or kind of complexity. You know, so you tend, you know, you, you know, American pickup trucks versus European cars, for example. And those seem to be differing heuristics. Um, you also get, um, th there's, there's another category where I was thinking where, um, so you have that, you know, big thing. And then you have that fundamental, I suppose, approach to, um, between, say, two extremes would be France and the US, where in the US it's assumed that anything good needs to be widely available, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, etc. I mean, they tend to... Actually, then, you know, until very recently, the Americans were not good at producing luxury brands because the natural instinct as an American is you sell it to more people, OK? Whereas the French heuristic is anything that's any good has to be only available in limited quantities. You know, there's a sort of French luxury goods thing where, you know, you literally refuse to make more bags that are selling out because you're preserving scarcity. And, you know, a good restaurant must be obscure and only known to the cognoscenti, whereas in America, a good restaurant is famous. And you, so th those things, I mean, they're, what's interesting is if you read Robert Cialdini's book on influence, quite a lot of, quite a lot of the things that persuade people are opposites. So two ways of selling something. Either everybody buys this, so it must be very good, or not many people have this, so it must be really good. And this is where I, what I mean. In, in psychology, the opposite of a good idea can be a good idea. 
I mean, Warhol said about Coke, didn't he? All the Cokes are the same and all the Cokes are good. The President of the United States can't get a better Coke than the bum on the corner of the street. And that's a very American thing. If it's very good, we should make it universally available. But, you know, I mean, and also it varies by brand. So if you're EasyJet, you know, there are things you can do to make money by premiumizing, which would make you quite a lot of money, but they conflict with the kind of democratic nature of the brand. And so, I mean, it, it also varies. Obviously, there are kind of, there are behaviours and, and promotional behaviours, for example, which are consistent with one brand and not another. Great, thank you. A very good answer. Um, I think there's one time for one more question, if anyone has another question downstairs. Um, with, like, online shopping at the moment um what do you think is like the most boring part of it which you think is kind of ripe for this um doing something different um you know hacking into those psychological beliefs about what's good um what do you think uh, th um, th there's one disappointing thing if you like which i think is true of all online activity which is it's very good at giving people what they think they want and it kind of worries me by the way because if you look at, say, I know it's a bit, bit of a flip, but online estate agency, if you talk to a human estate agent, <laughs> OK, one of the things, and now nobody ever says, aren't estate agents wonderful, OK? I'm asking to real tours for the benefit of any Americans here. OK, but one thing that estate agents do, which is really interesting, is they say that when people come to them, they always have a list of stipulations for what they want their property to have. You know, must have a garden, balcony, da-da-da-da-da, three bedrooms, OK? And the estate agent says that, if you show them a range of houses, they will almost certainly end up buying a house that contains none of their original... You know, they fall in love with a place that has a view of a river or something, OK? And they, they end up buying a house which actually meets none of their original criteria at all. And I do worry a bit about whether we're actually... That people don't know what they want, but they think they do. And I do wonder a bit about whether um, some forms of online interaction aren't throwing enough throwing in enough curveballs. Because actually a salesman does two things. I mean, David Ogilvy, when he retired, moved from New York um, to buy a house in Paris, OK? And while David, he was terrified of flying, so he crossed the Atlantic on a ship. And while he was crossing the Atlantic on a ship, um, uh, the house he was supposed to be buying in France sold. He got gazumped, basically, OK? And the estate agent... Um, says, I've got another place I think you'll like, gets David on a train for four and a half hours down to Poitiers, then takes him in a taxi for 20 miles outside Poitiers and shows him this 14th century chateau with like 50 bedrooms and sells him that. OK. Now, I'm sure there were other houses in Paris for sale at the time, OK. I'm sure what the estate agent was asking was two questions. One, OK, um, what, what does this guy want to buy? But two, what could I sell this guy that nobody else would buy? And sure enough, you know, romantic, Scottish, wealthy American, you know, with, you know, let's face it, a dollar pension, not a Frank's pension, etc., was one of the very rare birds who might actually buy this goddamn chateau, which had probably been on the books for like eight years or something, right? And I do wonder that actually we forget that human salesmen and intermediaries are doing two jobs. You know, they're offloading, you know the eccentric property on people... You know, a estate agent might have some weird eccentric place on the books, hasn't been able to sell it, and you come along and they go, these people seem slightly weird, they might actually be on for this. And I do wonder we're not doing that job, we're just delivering to the criteria that people have originally set. The other bit that's really boring is actually the whole delivery thing. I think it... My, my argument is that it... it Individually, it's fine, and individually having something delivered is more convenient than a locker. But at, at any scale level, I'm, I mean, what, what I'm looking at is, does has kind of the volume of e-commerce tapped out at Christmas? In other words, do people at Christmas reach basically what you might call the cognitive maximum for how many deliveries you can mentally cope with at any one time? And if we see Christmas tapping out and kind of not growing anymore, and, and people to some extent you know, maintaining the ratio of kind of online and offline. It's a clue that there is a cognitive limit to e-commerce as it's currently practised, which is just that, you know, at some level, if, let's say, you went and ordered six different things, it would probably accord you some mental distress. Like, did that, did, has that arrived? You know, and, oh, God, hold on, I better not go out this afternoon because, OK. 
And I, I, I definitely wonder about that. And the other, I mean, the other question is the environmental sustainability of last mile delivery and the environmental sustainability of returns. Because if you look at, uh, you know, say what you like about physical retail, okay, it's got 10 times the level of conversion of online retail, converts at 10% rather than one, and it's got a tenth of the volume of returns. So we mustn't make this mistake, which I think everybody makes, and I may, you know, make it myself all the time. When something new comes along, we tend to look at what's good about the new thing compared to the old thing, and we forget about what was good about the old thing that the new thing doesn't do. And uh, I, I, I think we've written off physical retail far too soon, because it's less efficient, but in many ways it's more effective. And I, you know, just as we wrote off direct mail, okay, because it's much cheaper to send email, but email gets email gets a response rate of what? 0.01 percent, okay? You can get six percent response rate from a physical letter. And efficiency and effectiveness aren't the same thing. And I, I, I think there's something contradictory about digital marketing, if you want me to be honest about it. I, I, think, it's I think there's something totally contradictory about a media agency, okay? Because you have media buyers who are trying to say, basically, all eyeballs are the same and you buy them as cheaply as possible. And you have media planners who are saying, eyeballs are very different, you should pay a premium for special eyeballs. Okay? And so you seem to have two groups of people who are at loggerheads. And in the same way, okay, there are two logical things which seems to happen to me in online um, marketing, which is you target people really effectively, okay? makes good sense, okay? targeting, good thing, know who you're talking to, know who your prospects are. And then you can reach people really cheaply. Okay? Now, they're both valuable independently, but actually, if you know exactly who your customers are, you should reach them expensively. Okay? If you're a car dealer, because expensive communications convert at a much, much higher rate than cheap ones do. You know, I mean, a phone call converts at a high, you know, can convert at a higher rate than a letter. Da -da -dum, okay? So if you, I mean, it's just what I'm saying is, okay, if you're a car dealer, okay, and someone comes in and goes and just looking at cars, you don't give them very much of your time. But if they say, I'm really interested in this, and I can't decide between this Audi and this Mercedes, okay, and you're an Audi dealer, you make sure as hell you take them as a test drive in the Audi, right? Even though it costs you, what, 100 quid to do so. Now, what strikes me as a bit weird is you hone in on your target audience, okay, but then you communicate to them in a way that's kind of offhand and cheap. Does, does anybody else see what I'm talking about? That actually, okay, I'll give you an example. Range Rover identified, I don't know, this was about 15 years ago. They identified maybe 20,000 people who are really hot prospects for buying a Range Rover. And they wrote to them and offered a four-day weekend test drive where they could take a Range Rover you know, with their family. And I can't remember, I, mean, I like 5% of the people bought a car. An unbelievably effective thing to do, okay? Now, I, I, what I don't quite understand is the, the, the reason we always did targeting in direct mail was that direct mail was expensive, so you had to write to exactly the right people because otherwise it cost you a lot of money. But there was another reason, which is you targeted... Um, so, um, but, you, but when you knew who you were talking to, it actually paid to use direct mail because it was a high-impact, high-conversion thing. You know, you could get, you could write to the right audience, you could get, for American Express, say, you might get a 7% um, conversion rate from a single mailing. Then you'd send the same mailing again a few weeks later, you get another three and a half, okay? You know, those are orders of magnitude higher than the typical conversion rates you get using digital only. And it seems to me we're doing two things which are independently intelligent, but which are kind of dumb in combination. Does, I mean, that, is that a worthwhile worry? I think it makes sense. So we need to spend more money. Yeah, <laughs> that as well, yeah. But actually, you know, if, you've, if, if you really know who you're talking to, we'll spend the money on something high impact and with what the Germans call stop effect. Um, uh, you know, don't just, you know, serve them 476 banners in sequence. That, that's the bit that I don't get. You know, if people are special, make them feel special, basically. That's a great way to end. Thank you okay. so much. Thank that you very really much. really great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. A big round of applause for Rory.